Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Matt. Um, I'm the treasurer of the SFP London, Greater London Student Chapter. Um, today we're very pleased um, to uh, have our first talk outside of Imperial College, I think, or the first one we've had. Greenwich. Oh, we did have one at Greenwich, so our second talk outside of Imperial College. But we're very happy to introduce a new uh, university to our uh, collection, I guess, or our, uh, our council of universities. Um, we, uh, yeah, so the, the London Suit chapter, we uh, host a lot of talks like this. Um, we, we host a couple every month. Uh, they're open to any student um, studying something to do with fire. They're also open to, uh, or, or, or interested in fire, they're also open to professionals um, from practicing fire engineers, practicing people in the fire profession. Um, and yeah, we're really hoping it can form some sort of uh, bond between industry, academia, and students coming in who are like, interested. Uh, we also have social events, so keep an eye out for those. They've been a lot of fun so far. We've had a pub quiz, we've had a Christmas party, and really, you're all, you're all welcome. Um, but, uh, hey, yep, yeah, welcome. Um, no, no worries. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a bit about what we do. Um, and if you have any questions, please always drop us an email. Always, use, uh, always happy to answer. But today, we're very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Francesco uh, Stuccia. Uh, he is now a lecturer at King's College, but he uh, started in perhaps the, the humble beginnings of Imperial College doing his masters uh, with, with our group, uh, Hayes Lab, uh, in self-heating. Uh, he's now he still talking about self-heating now and self-heating ignition, but he's uh, also going to be talking about batteries and the work he does there. Um, he's had quite a varied career. He, he worked in CERN for a bit as well, doing heat transfer after he did his uh, masters at uh, Edinburgh in electrical engineering. So he's really he's really got a whole uh, panoply of knowledge. He's, 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 if you've got any questions about anything, uh, Francesca can probably <laughs> help you a bit. But today he's going to be giving us this very interesting presentation on self heating and batteries. So please go have a round of. Uh, so thank you all for coming to Kings. Um, it's actually my first invited uh, talk since moving to Kings. So I'm very very pleased. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so. I'm going to basically give you a brief run through on self heating initially. So, what is self heating ignition? Um, uh, some of you work in the area, some of you work in a more applied fire. So, I'm going to give a very broad introduction of the theory as well, and then some of the results um, of specifically self heating and storage conditions. And I'm going to cover several materials from biochar to lithium ion batteries. A lot of the work I present is an ensemble of work done by many people, and I'll introduce them at the end. Um, but yeah, so the first slide was a introduction to this department. So it was actually a new department at King's Engineering um, and we have a new degree, General Engineering, that starts next year and we're building a fantastic building outside. Um, and it's a multidisciplinary department so there's not that many engineering departments that are so broad. Um, so we have electrical, chemical, mechanical engineering and so it's a very very broad scope. Um, so this works very well with fire which is also a very multidisciplinary discipline where you have a lot of civil engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers. Um, so yeah, brief introduction to our new department. Um, and then I wanted to give you a, all a brief introduction to combustion in general. So combustion <coughs> reactive porous media. Um, so fire, a lot of you work in building fires. I focus mainly on wildfires um, and storage. Um, but this is universal. So when you have a material and there are many voids, so if you have a porous material, such as coal, such as wood, such as biomass, um, such as polymers. There are in the solid um, carbon and so reactive material and non-reactive material. So in carbon rich materials, for example coal as you see here, you, you already have reactions happening at room temperature. So you have reactions happening inside. So if you take an infrared image of a coal pile, so this is in Scotland, a big pile of coal after mining, you'll see that there's heat inside because there's ex uh, exothermic reactions happening between the coal interacting with oxygen. Um, this can cause fires um, or cannot cause fires depending on the conditions. This doesn't require any external source. So this is happening at room temperature in Scotland at 12 degrees um, without any in external heat source. Um, so this is the material itself producing heat. Um, and this can lead to combustion. So point of note is it's not only, so a porous material is not only permeable to air, so it can be permeable to water, which actually reduces the reactivity, or oils, which actually might increase it because it adds fuel. Um, and the more permeable your material is, the bigger the surface area is, 
which allows more oxygen to interact with the reactive materials. Um, so this is the premise of sort of combustion in reactive media. This usually leads to smoldering fires, which can then transition to flaming fires. So I just wanted to introduce smoldering fires. Um, so smoldering combustion is the slow, low temperature, flameless burning of porous fuels. It's a heterogeneous combustion. So for flaming fires, that's usually in the gas phase and it's known as homogeneous combustion. Smoldering actually has gas phase reactions and surface reactions. So the solid itself interacts with oxygen and creates heat. Um, the main differences with um, flaming combustion is it's much lower temperature. So your peak temperatures are usually around 600 degrees. Um, it's a much lower heat of combustion, about five kilojoules per gram, and it propagates very, very slowly, about one millimeter per minute. And they are very, very hard to actually suppress. So they're much easier to start than flaming fires, and they're much more difficult to suppress. Um, so I'm not gonna talk much about smoldering, but self-heating ignition very usually leads to smoldering combustion, which is a big problem that a lot of you actually tackle in your research. So to bring this back to the global scale, why do we care? So why are soil, biomass, reactive media fires a problem? Um, various reasons. So one is ecosystem damage. So a lot of work is being done in the last few years. A lot of talks are happening about CO2 emissions. Um, and fires are a huge source of CO2 emissions. So globally, for example, in 1997, um, one mega fire in Southeast Asia corresponded to about 15% of global emissions that year. So 50% of CO2 emissions, that's equivalent to all of the automotive, uh, all the cars, buses, etc., in all of the European Union. Um, so that links to carbon emissions. So not only are you damaging the local environment, you're also emitting into the atmosphere and from safety, both of people and of equipment. So when you're transporting this material and it's reacting on its own, it could be very dangerous to the people driving the truck or the people living in a building where you have this storage or in a power plant. So if you have a power plant and you have reactive uh, reactions happening, it can cause uh, dangers to the people working there. For example, in the UK, this happened exactly seven years ago. So um, a lot of power plants in the UK are being converted to biomass use to produce more uh, renewable sources of fuel. Um, but sometimes the storage is not done properly. So here you had a storage um, of biomass pellets and there were some <coughs> hot elements coming off the line that brought heat inside and that caused a very large fire. And again, as I mentioned, these are very hard to suppress. So they actually lost the entire um, storage of the materials. Um, and actually in this case, it was from what I remember from the newspapers, um, it was about 3 million pounds of food, of, uh, fuel. So it's also a very big economic loss. Or in nature. So this is a wildfire in Alaska, started on its own um, in a mountain. And you can see the smoke coming out. You don't see any flames. Again, it's probably getting very slowly. And that fire lasted for about two years before it was put out. Um, so again, very difficult to suppress. And that caused a lot of ecosystem damage because that very much changed the landscape of that mountain in Alaska, which was very green before. This is in Scotland. So <coughs> this is where the base of the tree used to be before this peatland burned through. So there is a fire in Scotland that actually propagated um, about a meter in depth. Um, and so huge ecosystem damage because peatlands are a big storage of CO2. Um, and so that was all released to the atmosphere and dangerous for the people in that area. And also in um, handling of the material. So for example, there's a coal mine in uh, Texas. Um, and in 2002, this paper came out, it was 2000 roughly, that they noticed that after digging in the mines, all the waste, so all the rocks that were not reactive enough or not good enough, were put in a pile. And they realized the pile was emitting smoke. And they only realized this weeks after it had started. Because again, it's very difficult to detect smoldering fires. So I started digging and there was a fire in the middle of the pile. And again, it had started on its own based on the reactivity of the material in that pile. Um, from a global perspective, I just wanted to, so some of you work in this different areas, but I'll point out all the different areas. So we worry a lot about carbon emissions because we say that brings climate change. So it brings to a warmer climate. Warmer climate actually makes the soil drier. So things are more prone to igniting if there's less water in them because the water takes away the heat. So drier soils leads to 
higher chances of ignition. It also increases the temperature locally. So your soil temperature is higher, and a higher temperature leads to a higher reactivity. And so that also increases the ignition of probability. Increase of ignition probability is also increase, in, increase of self-heating tendency. So a material could ignite from external source, but it could also self-heat, as I'll talk about in this talk, um, which leads to either smoldering fires, which leads to lots of more carbon emissions, or flaming fires, or somewhere in between, so smoldering transition to flaming. Flaming fires are actually fine. You need flaming fires in the world. You need wildfires to happen um, because it's, a, it's the world's way to balance um, the oxygen concentration. So if there's too much oxygen, um, the higher the oxygen concentration, the easier it is for fires to start. And so that actually balances out um, the amount of uh, oxygen present. And that's how globally we've had an oxygen concentration um, balance. Um, and it brings to forest regrowth, so it actually grows back quite quickly. Smoldering fires, for example, if you're burning the peatland, that takes 10,000 years to come back. So it's not, um, it's not uh, renewable. So I hope I convinced you that these fires happening are not a good thing. I'm now gonna focus the rest of this talk on how they happen, so ignition. Um, so how do these start? So what is ignition? So let's first define what ignition is. Um, so ignition is the onset of combustion. It's the phenomena that strides from the initial low temperature of your material or the environment to the high temperature of combustion. Um, and you need several conditions for ignition. So you need a reactive system. So you need something that is within the flammability limits. Different flammability limits exist for different materials, but it has to fall within that flammability limit. And you need a thermal event of some kind. So that's either locally high temperatures um, that are reached and chain reactions happening. So you need the chain initiation reactions, the chemical reactions to start. Once those start, it's a very exothermic process and you have self-sustained um, reactions. There are two different types of ignition. So depending on the characteristics, characteristics of that thermal event that initiates the chain reactions, you either have spontaneous ignition, uh, so that's also known as auto-ignition in engines, for example, diesel. Um, and that's ignition caused by the response of the flammable mixture to the conditions of the environment. And that's an internal and bulk event, so you don't need an external source. So think of your diesel engine. You compress, you've changed the local conditions, and that causes your ignition. You don't need a spark plug like you have in your uh, non-diesel engines. Spark plug is a piloted ignition example, so the other type of ignition is piloted ignition. So it's igniting a flammable mixture by a pilot. So this is an external and local event. Um, like a spark ignition plug in an engine. And the pilot is usually a small but intense source of heat. So it could be a mechanical spark, um, it could be a glow plug, um, it could be a heated coil, for example, like Irix work. Um, and that also contributes to free radicals forming. Um, and again, that could also be a flame. So when you think of wildfire spreading, embers can spread and that flame can also be your new pilot. Just a note, if you want robust ignition, the combustion must be sustained when the pilot is removed. So if you want the system to actually be in a robust uh, mode, for example, you want the, the smoldering to be propagated if you're doing smoldering, then once you turn off that pilot, the reaction should be self-sustained. So in wildfires, what are those ignition uh, phenomena? So it could be a lightning strike, that's one of the most common starts of like uh, wildfires. It could be human, so it could be a human having lit, lit the fire, for example, dropping uh, cigarettes or dropping fuel that then leads to ignition. It could be a wildland fire spreading, so it could be embers traveling. Um, and those are all external ignition phenomena. Or it could be internal reactions. Um, so I'm gonna focus the rest of this talk on internal reactions for different materials. Why and where is this important? Coal seam fires are predominantly started by self-heating ignition. So this is a problem that's been well known from the 70s and 80s when there was a lot of coal mining happening. Um, but it's also happened naturally without our intervention for many, many years. So this is a picture of um, the burning mountain in, uh, in Australia. So that's been burning 6,000 years um, and it's been spraying. So clearly not us igniting it. There were no humans there 6,000 years ago. But that fire has been spreading slowly for 6,000 years. The other one is us intervening. So we dig to make a coal mine. We don't close that coal mine when we're finished with it. So this happens a lot in China. So there's a lot of work in China on detection of smoldering fires in mines because then they leave that mine. It's open. Oxygen propagates through and in a very, very slow time scales, it can take years. You actually reach the critical ignition 
uh, situation and then that burns for many, many years. So one of the recent examples for Americans, for example, is in Pennsylvania. Um, this happened um, and uh, locally they had put a trash pile on top of a coal seam. Um, that trash got ignited by, I guess, some vandals and it caused enough heat to spread to the coal and then that's been burning for 40 years or so. So coal is a very big example of self-heating ignition and industry very much has a big focus on the coal because that has economic impact for them. I mentioned the example of Tilbury plant at the start. This is, I mentioned this because this was UK. This happens all over the world. So in Denmark, they had a lot of issues similar to this. Um, they had a big new biomass plant and the storage just lit on fire and went. Um, but also in the transport. So these are all piles, but while you're transporting them, you have to store them somehow. Um, and now we're thinking of using biochar, for example, for removing some of the impurities in the fuel, making it more efficient, or for soil recovery. And that also increases the reactivity, as I'll show you later. Um, and so that increases the fire risks. So all of these piles in transport or in storage can self-ignite. It's just when and in what conditions will they self-ignite. Wildfire example is carbon rich soil. So peat is a common example. Um, so I've shown you the picture of the Scotland one, but this happens all over the world. So this is the Dymo one in Spain in 2011, um, Moscow fires in summer of 2010. Some of you might remember that there was always in the newspaper the fact that there was clouds of smog in, in Russia from all these spot fires starting. You know, those can self ignite because the temperature got very hot, much hotter than their usual summers, and that actually caused more proneness to ignition. Organic soils in Italy. So in Italy, we have a lot of these issues sometimes in the summer when the soil gets too dry. Um, and these fires can burn for weeks, months, or years. Um, so normally, if you're talking about Southeast Asia, for example, I'm thinking of your area, um, then once the monsoon season hits a lot of rains, then it will stop. But humans don't really stop it. So these fires become so large that you cannot stop them yourselves. Another example, which um, some of you like to answer then when are working on our battery fires. Um, so we need new batteries to power buildings and uh, electric vehicles rely on high energy density lithium ion batteries. So we're making these batteries more and more high energy and denser, um, but they have become an increasing safety risk because they have a huge tendency to ignite um, sometimes by penetration. So sometimes by mechanical failure, sometimes for abuse, sometimes by self heating. Um, it's estimated actually that on airplanes alone, there's a battery related fire once every 10 days. In a system where, and uh, Schwanze could give you a very, very long list of cases he's come, come up with. Um, and in a system like an airplane where safety is a primary concern, you don't want the safety and you do a ton of design on the safety of the aircraft. You don't want the safety to be unknown based on an item which you don't know how it will ignite and when. That's why now, a lot of times you're not allowed to put batteries when you travel in your uh, carry-on luggage. They don't want to deal with this at all. Um, so yeah, self-heating ignition is caused by the internal heat generation due to the low temperature of chemical reactions and insufficient cooling. So cooling system is another way to solve this. Um, and that causes thermal runaway uh, leading to ignition. So if you have a battery pack, let's say an electric vehicle, um, then even though your temperature is constant, the reactions are still happening and eventually you'll reach a thermal, wave, thermal runaway point temperature spikes and you have a car fire. And then, you know, you endanger the people inside. It's very hard to suppress these. Um, and so I'll focus the last bit of my talk on that type of fire. So how did the theory on self-eating come about? So I'm gonna cover a little bit of maps now. Um, so started with Semenov in the 1920s. So um, Semenov was a professor of physics and chemistry. Um, won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in the 1950s, and he showed that chemical transformations result from chain reactions. So he worked, his work on combustion led to increased efficiency um, for automotive, rocket engines, and a better understanding of how these reactions and pathways happen. His work is zero dimensional, so what he did is he said, consider a system of size L, and it's a reactive mixture. Um, you make it all a lump model, so you don't consider one dimensions, two dimension, three dimension, you just consider it one lump system, and you say, you equate the transient component to the heat losses and the heat generation. So you say that self-heating occurs when the heat generation from the, react the heterogeneous reactions, namely this exponential loss, so exponentially dependent on temperature, so I'll give you an example here, is greater than the convective cooling, so Newton's law of cooling. So um, 
basically the temperature difference with the environment, the heat transfer coefficient, and area over volume. So if you change the local temperature, so let's say your local temperature is very low, that actually cools the material faster. Um, and so convective cooling surpasses the reaction rates, and so it does not ignite. But if at some point your curve, your uh, reaction curve, surpasses that cooling curve, then you will actually have thermal runaway. What this means is as you change your environment, conditions, for example, let's say geometry all stays the same, you just change the temperature, then you could have a material that was not going to ignite and it was perfectly safe um, because the reactions that were happening, and they will always happen, they will just be much, much slower, um, are dominated by the cooling effects. And then if you increase the temperature by five degrees, then the cooling effects are not sufficient anymore. And then your temperature goes up a little bit, your reactions increase exponentially, and then you can actually reach thermal runaway. The question is only how long will it take? And for a critical size, so if you fix the geometry, ignition will happen at a critical temperature for a given reactivity. So then a student of Semenov said, okay, this is very nice, but it's zero dimensional. How do we actually use this? Um, so he said, he was actually the person who developed the thermal explosion theory, which a lot of people use if you work in explosions. And his name was Frank Kamenetsky. Um, and he said, let's make this a little bit more realistic. So let's consider the heat conduction through the material. Because in reality, your material is not going to be a single point. It will actually have a dimension. So let's take it as a one-dimensional problem, and let's consider the heat conduction through this material um, due to the chemical heat release of the material. So don't, don't assume that it's all a uniform temperature. See what happens through the material. So this is very important because if you have, let's say, a slab, um, you might have a boundary condition here, which is your cooling one. But if you're two meters into the slab, that two meters in will not see that boundary condition, right? So you have a temperature gradient developed through it. And so this lets you treat a lot more systems. For example, a slab is a good example. If you have an infinitely long slab, then you need to figure out what the temperature gradient is throughout um, based on the different local reactions, based on the different local temperatures. And that lets you have a much better understanding of the reactivity of that material. So he took the original heat equation. So he said, okay, let's not simplify it as much. We will still make some assumptions. So let's take the non-steady heat conduction equation. Um, and that's basically just the gradient, um, the, the divergence of temperature, all the thermal parameters here. Um, so you'll have a reaction rate, conductivity of the material, the heat of reaction of the material. It'll be based on temperature, based on the reactions, and it'll equal the transients. Um, and to solve it, um, he defined a dimensionless parameter. So for those of you who work on gas combustion, this is similar to the Damkel number in gas phase combustion. Um, so he defined a dimensionless parameter delta, uh, which is used to relate the geometry of experiments to ambient temperature. Um, so that links all the thermal properties, the activation energy, the size. So the critical thing here is the size of your system, um, the kinetics, the physical properties like conductivity, and the temperature. So then this, for a given geometry, there will be a constant value of this. And then you can work out, based on that constant value, the critical size for a critical ambient temperature. You can use this to solve the equation, and you actually find this dependence. So you find that the dependence on for critical size and temperature is just linked to this delta. So it's linked to a, a critical delta. Um, and the assumptions he made was that your material has to be reactive enough. Um, so it has to have a high enough reaction rate. So if you do this for a rock which has mostly mineral and a drop of carbon, this will not work. Um, because your material, if your boundary condition is here and you have very, very small carbon, your material will not be reactive throughout, right? It'll be reactive locally where that carbon is. So this only works for high enough reaction rates um, so that you can actually treat as a steady state problem in time because then all of it will be reactive. Because if it's the opposite, so if you don't make that assumption and you say, okay, it's all localized here, then it's very much time dependent because then the reaction happens here and then the heat spreads locally and then you have to see if that was enough heat to cause a, a sufficient spark in energy to have thermal runaway. Why is this theory important from, uh, for us engineers? So this is all from physics. Um, it's important because if you plot the inverse of temperature with respect to that first term of that equation he worked out, the slope gives you the activation energy. So the slope of this plot will tell you for a given geometry, so for a given critical delta, 
it will tell you, and given and you found the critical temperature and length, it will give you the, the reactivity. So it's a way to work for a bulk system what the reactivity is. So this is very big because I'll show you in a couple of slides, very difficult to do from a chemistry point of view. There is a third model, which I'm not gonna talk much about in this slides, which is called the Thomas model, and it was made in the 1960s. And it takes Frank Kamenesky one dimensional theory, um, but adds convective heat loss effects from the surface. So it tries to add some of the effects that will happen as you make it a two dimensional problem. Um, but this model has pros and cons, and from an experimental point of view, it's very hard to then link experimental data to this model. So I will not cover it much, but if you have questions on it, I'm happy to answer them at the end, um, just to make you aware that that exists. So there are limitations, of course. So I've talked about all the nice things that you can get out of these models, but it is mathematical models, it's not reality. So all three models that I mentioned assume a single step global reaction. So you assume that the chemistry is all, can be all bundled into one chemical step. So that only applies to materials for which a global one step kinetic model provides a reasonable approximation to the actual chemical scheme of the material. So for example, if you have sawdust, this would work all right. If you have some of the, some oils, this would not work so well. So it really depends <coughs> on the material. A large scale 3D model with governing equations imposing conservation of mass species energy, both for the condensed and gas phase, has never been developed for this. So it's still too computationally expensive. So this is what you would need to actually take the realistic problem and turn it into the mathematical model, but it's just not doable because you have to do this both for gas phase and solid phase. Um, and for those of you who work in gas phase combustion, you already know how complicated this is for just gas phase if you're looking at a single fuel. Imagine if you add all the condensed phase. And none of these models give an analytical way to calculate time to ignition. So time to ignition, so how long will it take for your material in storage to then actually ignite when it's at a critical temperature? cannot be worked out from any of these methods because one of the assumptions you made is you can treat it all as steady state in time. And that means that you cannot work out what the time is. So how do you determine real self-heating ignition of materials? All of you work in fire science or fire engineering. So you care about how the material will actually behave. So how do we link the theory to actual <coughs> fires? So we couple these analytical theories to experimental observations. There are four ways to do this. You can use small scale kinetic experiments, uh, TGA, DTA, DSC, this is what the chemical engineers and the chemists do. But this has the limitation that it only gives you zero dimensional behavior, which is very good if you want to know the local kinetics at zero dimensions. But if you're trying to scale a problem, for example, you're trying to work out that biomass power plant fire, this will not help you as much. Hot plate experiments give you one dimensional, um, and that's a good way to get some of the behavior, but that has a lot of limitations. So you can only have a very, very short um, height for your samples, and it has to be very long. So if you want to work out the behavior of a pile this high, you need 50 times in radius. So you start seeing that you, it becomes practically very difficult to achieve in a lab because you need a hot plate that is very, very, very large to then not have to worry about the boundary conditions um, on the sides. So you'd only worry about the boundary conditions in one dimension. Laboratory scale oven experiments are what I will present for the rest of this talk, and this is a middle scale. So it's not the small scale, and it's not a large scale field experiment. Ideally, what you would want is all data coming from this. So you want to take a field, 50 meters by 50 meters, burn it, let it self heat, so change the conditions, let it self heat, and then record the data. But that has a lot of practicality issues. It might take three to four years for it to self ignite. You're emitting. 50 meters by 50 meters of fuel, so huge carbon emissions, extremely expensive. So this is ideal, but ideally from a theoretical point of view, because this will give you the best data for your analytical theories, but it's not practical because it would take, you know, then you have to do repeats, you have to see what the sensitivity is for different conditions. So this might take you 100 years to get enough data to actually then link it to the analytical theory for one fuel in one condition. So depending on what you want to do, um, you have different levels of complexity you want to add. I will focus on this one for the majority of this talk, um, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, so the oven basket, so the middle size, um, is the most used methodology because um, it was developed by Bose in the 1970s, and it lets you predict the material's large-scale behavior by determining the behavior at a box size. Um, and 
it does this by, first I'll explain how they do the experiment. So they pack the samples in a wire gauze um, of different dimensions. It places them in a temperature controlled oven, so it's a fixed isothermal oven. Um, and it controls the oven with a fan to keep the temperatures as uniform as possible and to keep a high convective heat transfer coefficient. And then it just lets the temperature develop over time. The samples are placed in the oven um, at that prescribed temperature. The temperature rise at the core of the sample is measured over time. And then depending on the oven temperature, the sample will either heat past the oven temperature or plateau um, or have a sharp temperature increase and have thermal runaway. So this is an example for wood. So if you put wood in an oven, 140 degrees, this is a basket of five centimeter um, in diameter, um, so five by five by five. Um, then it actually still has, this is the temperature at the core, so at the middle of the box. So it, it does ignite, it does heat, so it does have reactions happening, but actually they're not sufficient to overcome the cooling of the environment. So even though it's 140 degrees, that is the cooling, right? It's lower than the temperature of the fuel. Um, and so then it plateaus and it does not ignite. So it has reactions happening. It does consume some of the fuel, but it doesn't burn. So it doesn't have uh, combustion. Increase that oven temperature, so increase that environment cooling temperature by five degrees. Now, instead of plateauing, it is the reaction rates are much higher than the cooling that comes from the environment temperature. And so you very quickly have thermal runaway, um, you know, three, four hours. Um, the results from these experiments are then used with the Frank Kamenetsky ignition theory to extract the thermal and kinetic parameters of the sample being tested. So you take that figure, I told you that the slope gives you the reactivity. Each one of these data points is one point on that curve. And then you make a linear fit through it. Hopefully it's linear. If it's not linear, it means that your initial assumption that your material was reactive enough is incorrect. Um, and you work out the slope of that linear line. The disadvantage of using this method is it's very time intensive. So that micro scale experiments I said the chemical engineers do takes five minutes. These experiments for each one take between three and 12 hours, depending on the size. And then you have to do it uh, for a lot of times to then work out all the different points. So it requires a lot of material. However, the main advantage of this method is that it's not sensitive to the reaction chemistry. So if you take the very, very small samples, it's extremely sensitive to the reaction chemistry um, and the setup. So if you have any changes in your boundary conditions in your setup, it will very much affect your results. This will not. So this is much, much less sensitive to your boundary conditions, <coughs> which means the data you get will have a lot less errors for your kinetics. And the results are less affected by temperature dependent thermal properties. So for example, the conductivity of your material um, will change with temperature. Um, and if you do a mi micro scale experiment, as that conductivity changes, that will change your results a little bit. For these bulk scale experiments, it will not change your results, which is very, very important if you're trying to do something practical. So if you want to actually understand how your material behaves in the bulk, rather than just the micro scale. So Micro scale is very important for the chemist to know the reaction rate, but if you want the effective reaction rate, so how your actual bulk system behaves, this is the best way to get it. And then you can upscale it. So then you can take those results I got. So I gave you the example of the slab earlier, so we'll do the slab again. That slab has a critical delta. So that critical delta is actually 0.878 for that geometry. And you can use it at scale to a real system. So let's say you want to work out a coal mine and how that fire propagates um, or how that self-ignition happens. You can take the data from that lab scale experiment and propagate it up to that size just by finding, because even though you did this for a cube, cube has a <coughs> delta and you figured out all the activation energy. So now you have all the parameters, except you know the size that you want to work out the mine. You know all the thermal parameters, you know all the physical parameters of your coal. So all you're missing is the temperature at which it will ignite. So that's what you work out. So you can work out the temperature, the critical temperature for a critical size. Um, so it's very used useful for upscaling to engineering sizes. So how, what did we do? So I'll give you some examples of some research. So first I want to show you biomass. So you know, this is an example of feedstock biomass. It can be torrified, so it can be pyrolysized, and then it becomes a bit darker. It can start charring, darker. It can become char, so, and then it can become ash as it all burns out. So these are all the different stages. So I'll focus on feedstock and torrified. So you take fuels that are either feedstock, so haven't been thermally prepped at all, or some that have been torrified. So I've had some pyrolysis happening to remove some things like water and um, materials that are not very reactive to make it more reactive. Torrified biomass is heated, is heated biomass in a zero oxygen environment. 
at temperatures greater than 250. There's no oxygen, so you're not having combustion. Um, and that releases some gases, uh, some liquids, and the solid, which is called char. Um, so the solid is what biochar is. For temperatures of less than 350 degrees, that's called charification. For temperatures greater than 350, it's called biochar, but it's the same process. Why do we produce it? Um, it's a practical replacement for coal. So clarified biomass integrates very easily with coal power plants. So it enables coal power plants to clean, generate clean energy without a lengthy or expensive conversion of the actual power plant, because it fits the cycle that already exists in those power plants. So this is what Drax did. So Drax produces about 5% of the UK electricity, and I can't remember the current numbers, but I think either it's been announced or it already has happened that 75% of it is biomass. 66% of it ran on biomass the last time I checked, but they announced that it will be 75% soon. So, you know, three quarters of that huge power plant that produced 5% of the UK energy is now running on this. Why do we produce it? Um, it remains, so the carbon remains sequestered in the biochar for centuries. So it's actually sustainable um, for carbon sequestration. Um, and it has beneficial effects when added to soils. So you can actually use this in soils um, because it's very highly porous it can actually act as a sponge. So if you have an area which has a very dry area and hasn't been um, fertile in a while, you can use this to increase the soil nutrients uh, in the lo in location. Comes in very different shapes and sizes and materials. So you can do this with rice, with wheat, with softwood. I'll focus on these three for this talk. There are hundreds of different biomasses. Um, so these are the ones I tested. Um, so softwood, wheat, wheat and rice, we, for Edinburgh, so Andre Maciek produced different biochars for us at different pyrolysis temperatures. And we said, okay, these have very similar properties actually, but how do they behave in ignition? So what I expected before I did the experiments, my hypothesis as your supervisor would say, um, is that you would actually have a steady state at some point. So actually reactivity would increase as you move down this plot, the material is more reactive. So it, it requires a lower temperature to ignite. And what I expected is this would plateau somewhere. In reality, what we got was a V. So we got that actually there is a very specific biochar temperature range for which the material becomes most prone to ignition, um, which was very interesting, never seen before. Um, and in reality, if you keep on going down this temperature range, so you make the pyrolysis more and more, actually it might even become less prone to ignition than the original biochar, uh, the original feedstock. Um, so we said, okay, is this just for rice or does this apply to all the other materials? So we did it for wheat. Um, again, use the same Frank Kamenesky theory to obtain all the parameters. And we got the different uh, kinetics and the different physical parameters out of each material at different temperatures. So we said, okay, we saw that V, and this is just the Frank Kamenesky plot you saw before, and these are just from the slopes. Slopes and y-intercept points to get the physical properties. We saw they were all very linear, so Frank Kamenesky assumptions that the material reactivity is high enough were valid. Um, and we saw that for all of the bit biochars we tested, 450 degrees was the biochar temperature for which the material was most prone to self-heating ignition. Um, and actually, 550 was very similar to um, feedstock for most of the materials. So the reactivity very much changed in a small temperature variance in pyrolysis. So we said, okay, maybe we need to do more tests. So we took softwood and we produced it at even more pyrolysis temperature. So we did 350, 400, 450, 550, 600, 700, 800, and again, same trend. So we saw huge drop in ignition temperature and at 450, the material was much, much more prone to cell heating. Um, so this wasn't uh, a question of us not doing a fine enough job in the pyrolysis temperatures. Um, and if we upscale this, so we say, okay, so this, how does this chemistry then apply to real world engineering? So we say, what, do, so this is a standard domestic storage, is about 2.3 um, meters in length. Um, so 2.3 by 2.3 by 2.3. And let's do it for transport as well. So this is the line for open uh, top container trailers. Um, and we say, okay, at what temperature will that ignite? So for rice, that's 60, 60 degrees. So it's very unlikely that in Britain you're gonna have 60 degrees environmental temperature, so that's fine. For wood, it was actually much, much lower. So actually, at 20 degrees, you already have ignition. So this is already reactive enough to ignite at, two, at uh, 20 degrees, which is why if you have this material there for long enough, 
it can ignite. Um, and so this is different for different materials. So for rice, it was safe. For wood, it was not. Um, and so it's very, very important if you're using these materials to know at what temperature it was produced because the biochar looks very, very similar. Produced at a different process temperature, looks the same char. It actually reacts very, very differently. So if you're produced at 450 rather than 550, at 550, so this was a 450 curve and it ignites at a 20 degree, um, for that same size, it would be 50 degrees um, for the 550. So increasing the pyrolysis temperature by 100 degrees in your production of the biochar makes it much, much safer for transport. We did this for a lot of materials, so I'm not gonna cover, I'm gonna cover the lithium ion batteries for the last 10 minutes of this talk, but um, just wanted to show you that we did this for materials of very different carbon contents um, and of many different types. Um, you can see a list of papers there. Um, and most recently we did this for lithium ion batteries. Um, so lithium ion battery fires, as I mentioned, common problem. Uh, so these are just a couple of cases that uh, Schwanz and Schwanzen then went put together for me. So um, one in Greece, one in the US, one in the UK, a couple in China, some in Dubai, some on aircrafts. So you can see this is not a national problem. This is very much an international problem. These battery fires are happening all over the world. Um, so we did the same type of experiments and the same type of theory with lithium ion batteries. So we took a pouch cell, we put it at fixed temperatures, um, and we, I will show you the results of that for batteries at three different stages. So the first stage is uh, heating up. So your oven is actually at higher temperature than your cell. So your cell has to get to that temperature before anything happens um, that is uh, exothermic reactions, not cooling enough. So this is just temperature increases uh, above the initial temperature, and you have slight changes in the battery, but everything seems fine. Then you start having cell heating. So after the crossover point, now your exothermic reactions are happening inside, your environment is cooling. So your oven is now your cooling environment, and you start seeing the battery starts to have um, some leakage, um, the color starts to degrade, um, and then thermal runaway happens very, very quickly. So there's a point, and let me see if the audio works. Battery very quickly, just thermal runaway, um, plastic coating melts. Um, there's a fast increase in temperature, and there's venting happening and smoke. There was no flare, no fire, and no spark observed in any of the experiments. So Schwann said did this for different sizes. So I said that as you increase the size, you get new data points. So he did this for one battery, and then and then did this for more and more cells. So he did this for one, two, three, four, and found that the, ignition, the critical ignition temperature um, started decreasing. Um, and he showed a clear trend, um, which is that as the required ambient temperature decreases as the number of cells increases, and during storage, you know, he did this for one, two, three, four cells, but during storage, there's a massive number of cells, so that will affect the critical temperature. If you take a rack, or if you take a storage warehouse, like Lenwin did in his recent paper, um, that has hundreds of thousands of cells. Um, and those are all stacked in massive racks. And so that critical initial temperature is a lot, lot lower. Um, so I wanted to mention this because most of these papers aren't out yet. So you guys have been very productive with papers from the Benwin. So there's what, four or five papers in this area, which we have in review in different journals at the moment. Um, but it's a very, very clear trend that self-heating ignition is a problem for batteries. And so battery fires can be caused by self-heating ignition. So before, bring you the conclusions of the talk, I managed to get it in time. Uh, I want to thank a lot of the people who worked on this. So I want to thank Yev Moraine, Schwanze, Zenwen, Andre, Rory, Xinyang, Han, and all other contributors who contributed to this work. I did this work at Imperial Haze Lab, so I did most of this work in the group of many of you. Um, and this work was funded, part of it was funded by APSRC, part of it was funded by ERC, part of it was with collaborators, for example, the biochar was all from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and so this work was a lot of people over the last six years. Conclusions of the talk. We show that ignition by spontaneous exothermic reactions at low temperature can happen for various types of biomass and biochar. I hope I convinced you that biochar production temperature is key if you're wanting safety of the material. We compared the spontaneous ignition temperatures for different materials. Um, we show that 450 is the key pyrolysis temperature that is the most prone to ignition. Um, we show 
similar self-heating ignition transparency on my own batteries, and we show that decreasing temperature um, for ignition happens for increasing number of cells. And hopefully, the work we've done um, in the last six years on this contributes to understanding a little bit better the onset of accidental fires for transport and storage. We very much wanted to focus on the bulk rather than the micro scale to show what real effects would be in a real system. Um, happy to take any questions. I try to leave 10 minutes roughly for questions. Um, but yeah, that is the work.